great Thank you all for joining us for this very special CUNY School of Public Health conversation with Dr. Mary Bassett, Commissioner of the New York State Department of Health, and Dr. Ashwin Vassan, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Uh, both uh, great friends to the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy, and we are truly delighted to uh, have them today joining us. I thank Commissioner Bassett and Vassan for being with us today to help CUNY School of Public Health and the public health community in New York mark and kick off National Public Health Week, which is the first full week of April each year and is a time to recognize the contributions of public health and highlight issues that are important to improving our nation's and our state's and city's health. Uh, there has been hardly a time, at least in my lifetime, where public health has been at the forefront as it has in the last few years. And we are truly, truly proud that we have two leaders, need I say, heroes of public health at the helm of the city and the state. Dr. Bassett leads New York State's Department of Health and has dedicated her life's work to improving and advancing public health and health equity for all, uh, both locally, nationally, and globally. Previously, she served as the director of the Francois Xavier Bagnou, uh, known as the FXB Center for Health and Human Rights at Harvard University, and the FXB Professor of the Practice of Health and Human Rights at Harvard uh, Chan School of Public Health. Prior to that, uh, she was commissioner of New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and many of us interacted directly with her uh, during that time. And need I say that the CUNY School of Public Health was enriched by the interactions with the department during that time. Um, before the commissioner of public health, uh, she was also the deputy commissioner of health promotion and disease pre prevention in that department. But earlier in her career, Dr. Bassett served on the medical faculty at the University of Zimbabwe and was also on the faculty uh, at Columbia University at Mailman School. Uh, I'm very proud to say that uh, Commissioner Bassett was a distinguished scholar and the recipient of our Public Health Champion Award at the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy. We welcome her back to New York and are truly delighted to see her back uh, on the public health arena in the state, and I'm sure will influence our city as well. Dr. Vassan is the head of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and we welcome him, uh, a good friend to the school as well, and to the public health uh, priorities in New York for a while now. He is a primary care physician and public health expert with nearly 20 years of experience working to improve physical and mental health in the city, as well as nationally and globally. He also serves as a faculty at the Columbia University Mailman School and continues to see patients as a primary care internist and New York Presbyterian. Uh, Dr. Vassan most recently served as the president and CEO of Fountain House, a national nonprofit fighting to improve health and increase opportunity and end social and economic isolation for people most impacted by mental illness, where he grew the organization from a New York-based community national to a national health organization and a national network across eight markets. Welcome back, Ashwin, to your primary uh, passion and uh, welcome to CUNY School of Public Health uh, participants today uh, in our seminar, and it is a genuine pleasure to have both of you with us today. For the next hour, I will moderate the conversation, and uh, time permitting, we will take questions from the audience. I will encourage the audience to put their questions in the chat box, uh, and as you know, uh, our conversation today will be recorded. Uh, 
Um, first and foremost, this is a historic moment. I see with us today two people that by nature are collaborative, but most importantly will open a new chapter that is much needed. Uh, and I really want to know how you will in fact engage each other in a partnership between state and city and how you plan to collaborate during this very critical juncture. Uh, are there sp special mechanisms, uh, uh, secret homing pigeons? Uh, how are you going to be uh, maintaining uh, the kind of interaction that we think will promote uh, health for all in New York City and state? Either of you can start. Thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, let me first, that, that's a really important question. And, and I, I must say that recent history gives us a pretty low bar to, uh, or, uh, to, um, to overcome. Uh, there, there was a, a, you know, an, a, a very unfortunate um, dynamic between the state health department and the, uh, and the city, uh, which the um, current governor has made clear will not continue. So there were actual, you know, we've all read in the press, there were people in, in uh, the state health department were, were actually barred from speaking with their counterparts in, in city government. Now this obviously makes no sense. The city is a huge chunk of the state uh, and it's also got a fantastic health department which has been a pioneer and an innovator in many ways. And of course, the political boundaries uh, have very little meaning for a highly contagious virus or for other uh, microbes. Um, I do wanna acknowledge that uh, it may seem like a really long time ago, but during Ebola, um, Dr. Zucker, then uh, the state health commissioner, and I was the city health commissioner, we agreed that whatever was going on between our respective bosses, that we would talk to each other every day. And we had a standing telephone call at 7.30 every morning in which we um, discussed uh, what was going on with Ebola, which turned out to be a, a, a genuine tragedy for West Africa, uh, but not a, a public health um, threat uh, that it was initially feared to be for the United States. Um, so that's how we've been communicating. I, that Dave Chakshi and I, you know, picked up the phone and talked to each other. And uh, we've, uh, and uh, Commissioner Vassan, and congratulations, by the way, <laughs> um, do the same. Uh, so there are no homing pigeons. Um, uh, there, we're we're each uh, just a, a text or a phone call away. Um, I don't know what else to say than that, except just before we got started, I, I said, um, you know, we're going to set up some standing meetings. But I think the important thing is the relationship and the fact that we can each pick up the phone, and that we trust each other, right? To um, because uh, you know it just takes one violation to trust of trust. Um, to make it not work. So we both know that and we trust each other. I, I, I believe that to be true. Uh, for the rest of the conversation, would you mind, Mary, if I called you Mary? And no, not Mary at all. You as yeah, well. Everybody, well, thank even you. the security guards you, at the you health know, department. You know you can call they me call either. me Mary too. <laughs> yeah. so, so Ashwin, what are the unified issues in your mind and joint strategies or priorities shared by the city and the state that you plan to focus on together. Uh, I, I can think of mental health, uh, the vaccine efficacy, emergency preparedness. Can you give us uh, some thoughts from your perspective as to sure. uh, commonalities yeah, yeah. that you'd like to address? Absolutely. And let me just say first, thank you, Ayman, to, for having me here today. Uh, it's, a, it's an honor to be here with you uh, and with Mary. You know, it, it's, it's an amazing thing when people you respect and mentors and people whose careers you've followed and in some cases emulated um, become your colleagues. It, it, it is a real honor uh, to work directly with Mary and to be working with you, Eidman, over the years. What, what you didn't mention is that I spent the first 10 years of my career in working in global HIV, where Mary Mary's uh, path-breaking work kind of showed the way not only to traverse this global to local um, public health career trajectory, 
but also, um, and, and she, she knows this, her work prior to becoming commissioner of health in New York City was directly responsible for funding my doctorate degree and, and my research there in Rwanda. So, um, you know, it's, a, it's just an amazing way in which life works and comes full circle. So um, to answer your question, I mean, you know, the virus has taught us, if it has not taught us anything else, it's that we're all connected. And, and as Mary elegantly said, these political boundaries that we, that we create to organize ourselves as humans in some ways um, mean, are meaningless in the face of highly transmissible, transmissible um, diseases, but also mean very little in the face of structural epidemics. Um, the policies that are set out at the state have a massive influence on what happens in New York City, whether that is in relation to Medicaid policy or housing policy, community investment, um, public health investment. I mean, it just down the line, we are but a subsidiary of the state in, in our hierarchy, but we also do quite a bit of innovation and, and programming in our own right that can be beneficial to the state. And so I, you know, this is a partnership and, and I agree with uh, Mary that it's an incredibly encouraging sign that we can just talk and solve problems together because at the end of the day, we both know we're coming to this work and at this work from a good place with a solutions focused mindset and with the best intentions. And that is the foundation of trust in many ways to get things done. Um, you know, I would also just add that what's also unique is that COVID has opened up direct conduits to the federal government in a way that we've never had it, certainly at a local level, or at least not in this kind of regular way. And to tackle some of the big structural challenges, whether, whether it's pandemic response or rebuilding our mental health system, just as two examples, we need massive federal resources and support. And the fact that they're a phone call away or a Zoom away is unique. And, and I think the three levels of government working together, um, certainly for the benefit of people in New York City, but much, much broader than that, um, is, is really a unique and powerful um, opportunity. I think you named a couple of key priorities, public health investment, pandemic preparedness and response. Again, they remain uh, crucial priorities. Investing in a permanent public health infrastructure that can be useful to us in both times of peace and relative um, calm and in times of emergency um, remains priorities that both the federal and state levels um, you know, have to be partners on. Um, certainly in all of this work, developing a public health platform that centers racial equity, health equity, and social justice has to be um, top of mind. And it's encouraging to have partners in the state government who understand that and who frankly laid the infrastructure for that here um, and that we continue to reap the benefits of. So, so those are just amongst a couple of couple things I would highlight. Well, thank you. And, and you, you are coming uh, uh, both uh, at a moment where uh, you know we we are hearing about the potential for a resurgence, uh, and and uh, the COVID pandemic has not been laid to rest. Just this weekend, uh, the governor uh, again reiterated that she encouraged utilization of masks for indoor activities in five counties in Onondaga, Oswego. Cayuga, Cortland, and Madison in central New York. And, and um, as we know, the number of cases there are about 38 per 100,000, which is double the rest of the state. So uh, Mary has her work cut out for her from day one. And uh, we are all, as your audience today, particularly interested to know uh, what you think about the pandemic at the current moment and where we are and what your plans uh, are to work collaboratively in terms of data exchange and about 
uh, commonalities and policies that can move us forward, hopefully, uh, towards containment. So I, I will start with Mary with the hot yeah. news about Central New York and what your thoughts are about that and how you can uh, help us understand better what's happening. Sure. So I just want to um, uh, be sure to say that New York City made the recommendation that uh, people uh, resume public indoor mask uh, masking uh, last Wednesday. So yes. uh, way ahead of uh, of uh, the, the the state um, yeah. and with the lowest rates in in, in the state, New York uh, New York City um, has lower rates than than the rest of the state. And uh, so um, you're right, we, we have a, a subvariant of the original Omicron variant. Um, and we have, uh, you know, generally across the country and in, in the state relaxed our uh, require, our public health requirements, the mask mandates gone um, in schools and the vax or mask mandate um, uh, is gone in, uh, in uh, in, in public indoor places. So we no longer have those mandates. Uh, people are tired of this. We're entering our third year. Uh, people want life to return to normal. I, I want life to return to normal, but uh, we, we still have uh, this variant that we've seen surging in Europe um, and going up here. There's no question that it's going up. Um, it's not showing that kind of Omicron cliff from our data that we saw that we saw uh, with the December surge, but it's it's going up. It's not just Central New York. It's going up in what's known as the Southern Tier. It's going up in North Country, um, and uh, it's a trend line I think that we are responding to um, because prevention it has to occur early when you have a virus that spreads exponentially. And uh, you know we have so many more tools than there were when New York City was devastated um, in uh, you know in March of 2020. Um, so you know that we're just beating the same drum and telling people that um, that it, it's uh, it's a, a clear recommendation uh, that indoor masking uh, be resumed. That's uh, that's looking looking towards yes the challenges of the near future, and I'm I for one yeah. am wary of people using the word endemic when we are ah. still in a in a phase where every few months we have an outbreak of some sort. Ashwin, have you something to add to to Mary's comments on on that uh, issue? Yeah, I, not not a whole lot other than to say we we are in a better position to respond to whatever the virus throws at us than we've been in any other previous way yeah, or yeah. Any other point in the last two years. And so much of the message to New Yorkers from me and from health officials is to make use of these tools, make use of these tools in calibrating your own individual risk, your own individual exposures, and the effect on your household and your community. Because as we know, not only is this an exponentially uh, transmissible growing virus, it's also has a significant amount of asymptomatic spread. And so the choices you make as individuals are not just about you, they're about protecting those around you. Obviously, we've rolled back a lot of our mandates. And, you know, I think we're looking at the data saying that this will be um, a wave of some kind. Agree with Dr. Bassett, our data doesn't suggest that it's going to be anything like the January wave, but significant nonetheless. And as we know, the effects of these waves are not felt uh, proportionally. They're not felt equitably, not only equitably by place and by race and by socioeconomic status, but also by vulnerability. Mm -hmm. People with pre-existing conditions, older people, unvaccinated age groups. Um, these are all people that are at high risk and while in public health, our responsibilities are to protect and promote the health of all people and all New Yorkers in my case, um, it's especially true for the most vulnerable. It's especially true um, for the most at risk, which is why we're advocating for additional boosters for older people in line with federal guidance um, and additional protections for other age groups. But I think 
top line is, is essentially that we are more prepared than ever to respond to this. This is not emergency response. This is integration of a set of public health tools into calibrating the way that we go about our everyday lives as best as possible. Can I just add to that, that it struck me often that people, you know, Omicron was pretty staggering, the, the rate at which it spread. We are clocking more than 90,000 new infections a day uh, at, uh, at, at one point in the state. Um, so there's sort of a sense that it spread by wildfire and every hit everybody. Um, and it, di it did uh, spread like wildfire, but we saw twice the hospitalization rate among African-Americans as, um, as compared to whites. So Omicron brought the very familiar disparities that COVID really drew the curtain back on. These are ones that we've, you know, we've, we've seen um, for decades and centuries in the United States, but um, Omicron uh, had showed them too. Um, so, you know, I, I often, we, we talk a lot about vaccination and about, um, you know, and about treatment, which is something that New York City has also taken really novel steps to ensure that, that people have access to treatment that um, I think we all can learn from. But um, there's also the whole question about inequality in our society that led to such different risk of exposure. And I very much hope that as we go forward, we don't allow that um, vulnerability to vanish. We're approaching a million deaths in this country. We've passed 70,000 deaths in the state. The deaths have you know, not occurred equally, as we've said, but they also were just far too high. Uh, we're in a league of our own as a wealthy nation. And uh, that, that should cause us to consider uh, what has made us so vulnerable. And I mean, if I can just add to that, the challenge of this work um, in this moment is taking decisions before things happen. I think informed by the catastrophic levels of death and suffering that in, in the main was entirely preventable or mostly preventable. We're making choices before we see indicators rise significantly, before we start to see deaths rise in advance of those things to save as many lives and prevent as much suffering and needless suffering as possible. And, and that's been, that is and remains the hardest part to communicate about. It's the hardest part to get agreement about and the, the most divisive part of pandemic response to date. Yeah, yeah. I, it's really I'd tough. like to shift the conversation a little bit to the after effects of the pandemic and uh, the people that have suffered from COVID continue to have a variety of needs, some of whom uh, continue to suffer from symptoms, but other, uh, other needs, life needs. Uh, and, and what are your approaches towards the uh, post-COVID uh, population in New York City? state and New York City, and how are you monitoring the needs of that population? Well, there, there are two main things that I think about, and one of them, um, uh, Commissioner Vassan has um, had really recent experience with it. Uh, the first is the impact of long COVID, about which we're still learning. And it's clear that it's real, uh, that there are people with a whole array of symptoms that follow a COVID infection. It's clear that it can occur among people who are were young and healthy, among people who fairly mild uh, initial uh, clinical course, or even apparently asymptomatic. So this is uh, a really good reason to push for prevention uh, because um, because there is uh, always the role of the dice of, of long COVID. We do know something about risk factors, but it, it, we still are learning a lot. And uh, we, we, uh, we don't have uh, clear ways of diagnosing it. It's still unclear how we should treat it. So we've been having conversations as a, as a department about what our role should be in long COVID. The NIH, of course, has a clear research role and trials are underway. Uh, but we're talking about 
you know, communicating with physicians about it, um, trying to uh, assist with dem disseminating uh, diagnostic guidelines, um, and all the way to, um, you know, thinking about how we can use Medicaid as a, uh, you know, as sort of a tool and looking at insurance coverage uh, issues. Um, so that's it on, on long COVID. The other one is, is, uh, is the impact, uh, the mental health impacts, which frankly, I think have affected every one of us. Uh, but obviously, um, we're particularly concerned about young people. And maybe this one I should turn to you, um, uh, Commissioner Vassan. Do you want to talk more about sure, mental health? Yeah. I, I can keep rattling on, but it, oh, please. okay. Um, Yes, I, I think mental health is indeed the public health issue of this next era. And it, I think it behooves us as public health practitioners whose expressed interest is in preventing, oh, I'm sorry, this happens. Um, is that a, a light? Expert, you weren't moving yeah, enough and your light went off. Timer. Um, <laughs> You know, whose expressed interest is in preventing suffering, saving lives, um, to begin to bring the tools of public health to bear on our mental health crisis, which includes measurement and problem definition and population health um, analytics and informatics, but also life course approaches to protecting the mental health and well being from birth to death. And preventive approaches, as well as the long-term care of people who live with chronic mental illness. Those are all priorities that I think can no longer be, I know that at the state level, there's a whole separate agency that runs yeah. mental health, but we brought these agencies together here in New York for that expressed reason, because these are not different. The mind and the body are connected, and we're learning, we're able to say that and talk about that in a way that I've never seen in in all of my years of working, and I'm sure Dr. Bassett hasn't really seen, we have a moment where this issue is top of mind for everyone. I would also add that we're seeing this in other related issues like our opioid epidemic. Um, so much of our opioid epidemic is untreated or undertreated mental health concerns, and we're losing one New Yorker every four hours to opioid overdose. In any other circumstance, that would be a five alarm public health fire we'd be screaming that from the rooftops. And it's just the, the suppressive effects of the pandemic and the news cycle around that, that has made it harder to bring that to bear. But if we are not mustering a response to that over the next weeks and months, and I'm very proud of the work that's been done here in New York City to innovate and push that envelope forward, especially recently with the launch of our overdose prevention centers, we need to continue that work, scale that work, measure that work, and make it standard of care for the city and the state and this nation. Lastly, we remain a, a deeply unequal society, a deeply unequal city that where the burden of chronic illnesses um, fall disproportionately on low-income people, on communities of color, on people that have been historically redlined and kept outside of um, access to the best quality care resources and investment. And that remains to be the case. Cardiovascular disease is still the leading killer in New York City. Cancer is number two. Diabetes is not that far behind. Now is our time, I think, to tackle those epidemics with an equity focus, with the focus on who's being uh, disproportionately impacted. And to, especially here in New York City, to get us back to that work that we were so known for which is innovative approaches to tackling cardiovascular disease, to tackling high blood pressure, to improving our food system, especially with our current mayor. We've got a credible messenger in terms of someone who wants to see our food systems change for the better, but also more equitably. So I think there are chronic public health challenges that we need to be addressing now. And now is our time because public health finally has a um, a level of public discourse, maybe not always the healthiest public discourse, but at least it's a level of visibility that it's never had. And it's our opportunity as, as true believers to really push forward a holistic health agenda. Well, I have to look at some of the questions I'm receiving from the chat box. And uh, one of the questions relates to resources invested in public health. 
Uh, obviously, some of them are tongue in cheek, talking about $850 million uh, in a new stadium, for example. And I hate that kind of comparison, why this and not that. Uh, the issue here is, what, what is your sense of investment in public health at the current moment and for the future? And do you feel like the legislature is, uh, is aware of the need for sustaining public health and strengthening the public health infrastructure? Well, I'll get started on this one. As you know, the budget is still being negotiated here in Albany, where I'm sitting right now. Uh, so we don't have a budget yet, but the uh, proposed executive budget was $216 billion, uh, which is one of you know the biggest budgets that we've seen. Part of it uh, was a boost from the federal funding that Dr. Vassan mentioned. The, we, I think it, I'm not sure that I remember the exact number, but I think it was uh, over, over $20 billion in federal um, supports help buoy the state budget. And, and the health department um, is for the first time in a long time not being asked to cut its programs. So uh, that gets me to the issue that the, you know, that the damage to the public health inf infrastructure wasn't just the very regrettable departures that we've seen during, um, during uh, COVID. Uh, there was, you know, there's been cyclical boom bust underinvestment in public health and a enduring confusion between the health care sector and public health. Um, you know, everyone, um, so public health in particular in, in the United States has always uh, been experienced under investment. So no, we haven't, the, the proposed budget doesn't fix those many years of underinvestment, but it's the best budget that we've seen in a very long time. Uh, the the uh, state health department budget is $88 billion, including the federal share of Medicaid. So that's, that's a big number. But I think we still have a, a lot of work to do um, to, uh, you know, to um, make it clear that if we want to restore, for example, local health departments, and, and New York City is a local health department, but a very big one with its own tax base, most of the counties don't have that. And we have counties that have, you know, just truly skeletal staffing. Uh, and, you know, the new budget improves the amount of money coming from the state to the local jurisdictions. It doesn't fix all of the reductions in Article 6 that New York City experienced, but even New York City is going to get some more money than it used to, um, uh, that, it, that it didn't pre the previous budget. Um, I don't want to get too much in the weeds, but, you know, if we want to say that uh, public health should be local. We have to invest in local health departments, and we still have a ways to go in doing that. You know, our main uh, budget um, uh, is Medicaid, which I'm, I'm expecting that we'll we'll get to um, uh, uh, some. I mean, that the amount of I think at, outside of Medicaid, we have a budget at the state of a, maybe six billion dollars, six and a half billion dollars. Uh, so a big, big chunk of the um, of the state budget is Medicaid and the uh, Affordable Care, uh, New York State of Health uh, portal, essential plan, chip, so on. So, you know, that's not the whole public health infrastructure, right? So we, we still have work to do to, um, to build up our public health infrastructure. I'm getting a lot of questions in the chat box, but uh, one of them is really interesting, and I, I, Ashwin, maybe you can uh, think of, of the best answer to that one. And I'd like to ask a question, how do you envision community-based organizations and the public health infrastructure you seek to create mm -hmm. in New York City? And are there specific ways uh, you hope to change the relationship between the departments and community-based organizations? That's Great an question. question. Just getting back to, to Mary's question for just a second though. Um, I think the last comment I made about prevention and preventing things from happening in the first place makes it hard to put together an argument for sustained public health investment to people who are not attuned to this issue. And that's our challenge. That's on us to say, 
this is our watershed moment. This is, we must kind of take an approach of never again, should we be left as unprepared as we were as a national public health system, as we were in March and April of 2020. And that's the result, the direct result of decades, if not longer of intergenerational disinvestment from public health. And, and so if we want to change that, we, we have to make an argument that the next time, the next challenge, whatever we face going forward, we need this as a core part of our, of our public administration, our infrastructure. It should be an expectation of citizens that they have a functioning public health system. And, and you know, I think they should hold our leaders accountable for those investments. Um, because I, I have yet to see a political movement, a grassroots movement for public health investment. I hear a lot of people like me and Dr. Bassett talking about the need for more investment, but we need a citizen-driven grassroots movement to demand more investment into public health for the future. Otherwise, it's going to be left to us to keep talking about. So I'll say that in terms of CBOs, community-based organizations, um, first thing I'll say is that the work, the legacy that Mary left behind here in New York really opened up an, a, an entirely new conversation about place-based public health in New York City or revitalized that conversation back to a day when you had district public health offices where the health department was a presence in your life, giving immunizations, delivering care, near where people live and in the work to revitalize our neighborhood health action centers around the city, it also created a network of community-based organizations with which we formed strong relationships, did health education, um, engaged in workforce and training. And that is, I believe, a core and must be going forward, a core part of our infrastructure when we think about delivering essential public health services. It is not to say that the government has to deliver those services. It is indeed to say that the government can mobilize their resources and disperse them through trusted organizations, through trusted people, through um, actors in, particularly in marginalized communities that have built up over time and through service, the ability to form real relationships and trust. And nowhere has that been more embodied than in our public health core work. Over the last nine months, we've mobilized relationships, a lot of them previously pre-existing relationships built off of the work of the Center for Health Equity here in the health department. 80 community-based organizations were received funds from the health department to do things like vaccine education and outreach, to do disbursement of PPE, to do testing, and now more recently treatment education campaigns, and always with the express goal of not just sending out messages, but attaching messages to access and ensuring that when we went there and said, when we went to any community and said, we want to work with you and let us do this campaign, we then also brought mobile resources there, or we made sure that they had a conduit to testing and treatment and vaccination. And, and the results, I think, have been very impressive. You saw these durable, much in the way that COVID's ills have been experienced inequitably, so too has the response and access to the tools of the response. And through the public health core, a massive mobilization of boots on the ground, as well as community-based organizations, most of those boots on the ground placed in community-based organizations, we're starting to see those vaccination gaps close in predominantly black and brown and low-income communities across New York City, the 33 zip codes that were most impacted by COVID, we've defined them, our tree neighborhoods, um, and we're starting to actually see results there. So I think there, I, in my mind, that to me is the equity delivery system. That is our real attempt to operationalize the principles of equity. And going forward, I think that has to be one tranche of what we do for any citywide public health initiatives. We have to figure out a way to reach into the hardest to reach places or places that we as government have found hardest to reach. And now we have a conduit and an infrastructure to do that. So this begs uh, the question, and mm -hmm. I, I did work with Mary when, when she was here in New York and mm -hmm. I'm very, very sensitive to her uh, deep understanding and commitment 
to the concept concept of social determinants of health. So I, I I don't think that anything more than COVID has shown the interconnectedness of housing, food security, all other uh, intersections with the health and health outcomes during the pandemic. Do you see that there will be a more collaborative and perhaps streamlined relationships between commissioners and domains of public service as a result of the pandemic? I, I certainly hope so. I, I think some of the things that, that Dr. Vassan has just highlighted are really form the foundation uh, for say, making it clear that this isn't just about, you know, kind of loving each other, although I hope, you know, we do, uh, you know, the sort of happy circle with arms entwined. This is about delivering on our promise as government. And it's on that equity is linked to excellence in public health. We, we pursue equity because it allows us to be better public health practitioners. And, and that's why it's just so gratifying to hear you relay these things, um, um, Ash, Ashwin, um, because, uh, because that's, that's really should be the foundation that we, we, we do right. Uh, when we do right, we do better. <laughs> Um, and um, so, you know, I, I, this really depends on uh, the, you know, working across government and, um, you know, economic development, agriculture, uh, all, uh, environment, um, uh, depends on, on, on state leadership and city leadership. I think we're well placed to see that happening. Um, but it, it, it does depend on leadership and, you um, and it's not, it's, it, it's in my role, uh, I feel like it's my job to like get out of my lane, not to tell other people what they should do, but to keep sounding the fact that we need people to have a decent everyday life. They need to get, you know, paid a living wage. They need to be able to be housed. They need to be, uh, have available and affordable uh, access to healthy foods. So that this is all, part of what it means to be healthy, even if I, as a health commissioner, can't make these things happen, I can talk about how important they are. Um, so, you know, that, that's where I am on, on this right now. Uh, and um, at the state level, I feel like our responsibility is to support the local um, uh, health departments in accomplishing these things. And probably the best tool that we have coming up is the Medicaid waiver, uh, which, um, it's, um, which is how we get sort of creative use of Medicaid funds. A lot of the dollars that I'm talking about are shipped out in the form of reimbursement for healthcare service delivery. But these waivers that we get uh, allow us to create new relationships with stakeholders, community-based organizations, and, and I, may, I don't know how much more time we have, but um, the, the new uh, request, which should be public in the middle of the month uh, from the state government, uh, is very much hinged on the idea of equity, on the idea of uh, supporting collaborations between local health authorities and various local stakeholders uh, to, you know, and it's got a big price tag on it. Um, I think it's $13 billion or so, between 13 and $14 billion over five years. So that ought to be a good resource, I hope, um, as, as we go forward. All of this, in the end, gets grounded in the budget. If I, can just uh, I cannot, I, I can't tell you how many questions are coming through the chat box. It's something I've never experienced before in any of these presentations, but I'm trying to be fair <laughs> to your audience. Well, yes. At the same time, no allow you the opportunity <laughs> to discuss these very important issues. One question was uh, regarding the New York State and New York City, how we're preparing for the possibility of expiration of the COVID-related public health emergency. Uh, right. Is that something on your minds, both of you? Absolutely. Yep, it's a huge issue and, you know, yeah. with the Congress sort of, even in the more near term, with yeah. the debate in Congress about reauthorization of new COVID relief funds, we're already seeing um, two levels of impact. Number one, 
um, we're seeing providers pull out of the space um, because of lack of reimbursement. So lack of HRSA reimbursement is forcing or is causing certain providers to pull out of the space because they can no longer request reimbursement for providing services for people without documented insurance. So we're, of course, that falls disproportionately on the uninsured, the underinsured, people who lack documentation, people in high risk settings. We're seeing providers pull out of congregate settings and shelter settings. So this is a real concern for us in the immediate. In the medium and long term, this affects future responses, right? This affects our ability to have enough vaccines and tests and um, treatments for whatever this virus might throw at us next fall, uh, over the summer, who knows, right? And so, so I think that in the immediate, we're, we're certainly advocating strongly, and you saw the mayor do this and myself do this on Friday, advocating strongly for um, our partners in the federal government who have, been, who have really stepped up time and again for us to, to do so again. Right. Um, otherwise, we, we will try to drive as much care as we can through the ordinary health system. But as we know, the ordinary health system, healthcare system, leaves an awful lot of people behind. And so I think it is a challenge. Um, and it is one that we are taking very seriously here in New York City. We're also so really concerned about the unwind for people who got, and you know, many, many more people, something over one and a half million people became Medicaid eligible and uh, enrolled in Medicaid during the pandemic. Uh, we, we have, uh, you know, nearly a third of New York, um, New York state residents are, are, have their health care coverage through Medicaid. Uh, just to give you an idea of how much poverty there is in our state, that's 138% by and large, most people of the poverty line. So uh, many mo they, for two years, nobody's had to re-enlist or whatever, you know, re-enroll, um, and some people um, will no longer be eligible, uh, and some people will. So figuring out how to do this with making sure that we keep people as covered as we can. Um, Ninety-five percent of of uh, New Yorkers are have health uh, health care health insurance coverage. That's that's a good number. Um, but um, but we we are very concerned that we keep people covered um, after the federal emergency ends, which we we think may be in July, uh, but we don't know. They they renew it. So far, they've been renewing it. Uh, so in addition to these recent failures of Congress to meet the executive's request for COVID funding. We are, you know, we're not gonna be in this emergency forever. Uh, and, uh, and it will uncover, um, you know, the fact that, that we don't have uh, universal access to healthcare insurance. So uh, Ashwin, as you know, Columbia University and its key partner, CUNY Graduate School of Public Health, uh, have won the contract to be the Pro Pandemic Response Institute for New York City. And this is in collaboration with your department, of course, and with the EDC. Uh, do, you have, uh, do you have any uh, ideas as to how you envisage this uh, new endeavor, the PRI being a good partner to you and to the city and being of value to the next chapter uh, of the pandemic and future risks? Thanks. Yeah, we're very excited about the PRI. Um, if New York wasn't already the public health capital of the <laughs> country, I think it is now. And this is a testament to that. Um, this is all about preparing, preparedness and centering, um, you know, really a multi-sector response, um, a multi-sector learning opportunity as well. I mean, I, I think if we're not doing a really thoughtful postmortem of all the things we've learned and things we've done right and things we maybe could have done better, then that isn't consistent with yeah. public health as, as a learning organization and learning field. And, and I think, you know, a collaboration with our partners in, in academia, particularly partners that 
have such a public mission um, and a mission to serve the generally underserved as CUNY, um, I, I think is a, great, is a great thing for public health. I think it will hopefully provide lessons, not just to New York uh, and New York City and state, but also well beyond that about how the city that was really hit the hardest is, is building up some permanent preparedness assets for the future. Well, I will tell you the, the range of the questions is huge, starting from climate change, which requires an hour in of itself to uh, putting masks on, on babies. So, but I, I have to choose the, the very few minutes left here for you to, to ask each other a question that you think is pertinent. And I don't know who will start, uh, but maybe uh, you decide. I don't know. My question we've already talked about. I had a heads up that we would be asked, and I was going to uh, ask Ashwin about you know the continued focus on place-based approaches. But I, I think we've talked about that a lot. Um, yeah, and, and I was going to ask about Medicaid. You know, of the one third of New Yorkers that um, are on Medicaid, fifty-six percent of those recipients are in right. New York City. Um, 600,000 enrollees in New York, uh, New York City, that's about 63% are enrolled on the essential plan, which is yep. essentially people who fall outside of the cracks of that right. system. And that's in addition to people who are covered under NYC CARE, which allows access to our public safety net system. So I think Dr. Bassett highlighted it well. I, I think the waiver is a massive opportunity. And so the que that's really the question I had was right. how do we collaborate around Medicaid? I, like Dr. Bassett, am not um, a believer in creating an artificial divide between healthcare and public health. We can have mutually reinforcing goals. But one of the things that I think public health is there to do, we don't have an obvious business interest in healthcare revenue. What we have is a public health interest and a public policy interest and a social interest in protecting as many people as possible and ensuring that our healthcare systems don't leave people behind. And so when I think about setting population health goals under any, whether it's the waiver or anything else, I think it's about leadership, as Dr. Bassett said. It's also about ownership. Who is accountable for delivering on those goals, whether it be COVID results or reducing the burden of cardiovascular disease, who's accountable to that? Can we hold segments of government accountable to that? And if you can start with that, whether you're designing a waiver program to disperse $13 billion in monies, or whether you're just organizing the routine activities of, of government, if you have a singular or a set of goals around which you can organize that are centered in health and well being. Then, then you've already done half the work because you're organizing government as a force for good in people's lives. Well, there are only two minutes left for us and uh -huh. that is just enough time for me to say thank you. And we uh, in New York are very fortunate that we have 12 schools and programs in public health uh, with a large proportion of which, uh, five of which are uh, public schools of public health. And we hope very much that uh, you will allow us to serve your needs in graduating uh, well-prepared public health professionals, but also uh, to serve you also as uh, an intelligence trust and we hope very much as public schools of public health that you will influence us in how we teach and what we teach. I am extremely grateful to both of you uh, for, for many things, but most importantly, for showing such goodwill uh, towards each other and for such a commitment to shepherd this next critical chapter of the health of New Yorkers towards better outcomes Thank you, Ashwin. Thank you, Mary. What a great pleasure. This uh, will be recorded, as I said, or has been recorded, and will be available on our website for those of you that would like to have access. Again, many, many thanks to both of you and hope to see you again soon in person. Thank you. Thank you so much.
If there was a way we could get the chat, that would be great. I that would be good. Uh, I will make sure that if it is possible that IT will will forward that to you. Thank you.